Welcome back to Daily Bread Personal Finance, helping Christ followers develop biblical foundations and practices for their personal finances in order to build true wealth at last. This is video number seven, uh, the final one in the series called Giving Little as Much When God is in It. And this final video is focused on the most important thing that we probably have wanted to get to uh, in talking about what Scripture says about our relationship to money, which is the importance of sharing resources. And of course, um, for me, I you know was raised in a tradition that um, comes out of a Wesleyan tradition, and so John Wesley, of course, is important. Uh, when I studied in in you know for ordination and stuff like that, we looked at Wesleyan theology. And John Wesley, who lived in the 1700s, had a really good threefold, um, very simple philosophy on money. The first one is earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And at first it was a little strange, but um, John Wesley really lived this out. The man lived on like just potatoes for like a year and a half one time so that he would have more money to give to other people since it was like the cheapest food he could get. And it was just enough to kind of keep him healthy enough to do his work, but basically be industrious. You know, he sold, he wrote and wrote and wrote. He was very good at publishing books. And so he wrote all these books and made all this money and he spent as little of it as possible on himself and saved all the rest so that he could give as much away as possible. Um, when he died, people had come, um, you know, the lawyers and everybody else had come to divide up his estate and they were amazed. They, they couldn't believe that someone who was so well known and had sold so many books and all this stuff had so little money left to his name um, because he had been so effective at basically giving it all away while he was already alive. So 2000, this is the number of times the Bible mentions caring for the poor. Um, it's one of the most mentioned topics in the Bible, which of course makes it strange in um, today's um Oh, ecclesiastical institutional structure, uh, structure of the church that um, it does seem to be one of the like more tangential, um, one of the more side project, side quest type of things for Christians. Um, but this really is the, over, you know, overwhelming center of scripture has to do with the poor and the oppressed. So giving the how and why of generosity. So Matthew 6, 1 through 4 says, Do not announce your gift or your generosity. It's not meant to be something that you're seen doing, so to speak. It's just meant to be part of who you are as a person. Um, I had read a long time ago, Do something good today without anyone knowing it. Um, this in itself, you know, I could end the video here. This is um, just a good way for us to model what scripture really says is to just do it, not because of anything we'll get for it or any positive feeling you'll get for it. Do something simply for the sake of knowing that you did something good today. First Peter 5, 2 says, serve others genuinely, not for money or for personal reward. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, this is 3, 5, and 6's cousin, says, honor God with your wealth. God will provide all that you need and all of your community's needs. Deuteronomy 15.7 says, do not, and it is like in a list of kind of um, very important statements saying, do not be tight-fisted to the poor. Proverbs 14.31, oppressing or kindness to the poor is either mistreatment or honoring of God. And of course, Matthew 25.31-40 through 40 says, when we do not or don't care for the poor, is that it's as if we are or are not doing it to Jesus himself. So, um, Again, it's very important in Scripture that the way that we treat those um, that others view as less than, um, it's as, it's it's the way in which God sees it as us doing it to Him. So you know when you pray and you say, "God, I love you," well, you're saying that, but how do you show it? Well, you show it by the way that you treat others, specifically the poor and those who are viewed as less than. And then Deuteronomy twenty four ten through fifteen and seventeen through twenty two talks about. Um, don't hold a person's pledge against them. Don't take advantage of the poor or the needy. Remember when you were slaves in Egypt, and so don't harvest the edges of your field so that you can ensure that the landless or the moneyless have something to eat in hard times. So essentially the community has to take it upon themselves to ensure that those around them who have need, whether they are part of your community or not, have enough to eat in hard times. So the Didache, one six. this is a... Um, Later Christian writing um, in the, the Christian community, 
Um, it didn't make it into scripture, but it has some um, important uh, sayings that early Christians would have known. And this one has always stuck out to me, Dead K16. Let the gift sweat in your hand before you give it. Um, so think about who you're giving it to it, why you're giving it. Let it sweat in your hand. So, you know, there's those two sides of things, right? To be absolutely generous and to give things away, but also important to be wise with how we're giving and who we're giving to. Matthew 22, 15 through 22, give to God what is God's. The underlying meaning, as I mentioned in the last video, is it's all God's in the first place. Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve God in money. Deuteronomy 23, 19 and Exodus 22, 25, um, it talks about um, don't charge people interest. Um, if you're going to lend something to someone, if you're going to give something to someone, lend it or give it. Don't um, do it to make money off of other people. Um, very important topic in the Old Testament. And of course, do not take advantage of others' hardships. It, it would seem it should go without saying, but it, it, it needs to be said sometimes that the purpose of you know living a Christian life and having money or being wealthy and things like that, it's important to not do so at the advantage of someone else's hardship. If someone's under hardship, help them, um, do the right thing, and know that you know in doing so, perhaps you might get some blessing out of it as well. And of course, um, other mentions, Leviticus 19, 25, make, makes many, many, many provisions for the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 8, there'll always be the poor among us. Sometimes this is people's justification for not helping poor people. Well, we're always going to have the poor. Jesus says it as well. Um, but that's not why it mentions it. It mentions you're always going to have this obligation on you. No matter what day and age um, people of the faith are living in, they're always going to have poor to serve. Um, so you always have a job as a Christian and, and a means to love God, which is through the poor. Psalm 72, 12 through 14, um, God delivers the needy when they call the poor and those who have no helper. And so invest in what matters, true wealth that lasts. So again, we just talked about investing just as a wise practice to ensure that you're taken care of when you're older. Um, but of course, investing in others is what really matters. And so you cannot outgive God. Um, Matthew 18, 21 through 35, God has given more than we can comprehend. Nothing we do or give out does what he's already accomplished. Um, again, this I th think ties to the parable of the um, ungrateful servant. Giving is a practice of recognizing that our possessions and our wealth do not have a grip on us as they used to. So when you give, when you're generous, um, that in essence is you demonstrating how little power your money and the things that you have um, – how little power they have over you as a person. Second Corinthians nine, six through 15, God loves a cheerful giver and, you know, so, so sparingly reap sparingly. If you freely scatter gifts to the poor, um, you're giving supplies to the needs of God people, but that also acts as the direct thanks to God. Um, another um, saying that one of my old pastors used to say, you can't do God's math. Um, of course, you know, I think of Ananias and Sapphira, Acts five, one through 11. They were, they were holding back, you know, they, they lied about how much they got because they said, oh, we'll sell this and we'll give it all to God. Well, then they hold back. And of course, you know, famously in that story, they both, um, fall over dead, but, uh, essentially, you know, um, you know, this isn't necessarily tied to, you can't do God's math. You can't do God's math in the sense that, you know, I think I'm only giving a hundred bucks in the offering plate, but I don't know what impact that might have on somebody. Um, and so this is more, the opposite side of that coin to say, look, you know, um, I think I'm only holding back a little, but I don't know how much, you know, if I were to give that, um, to help somebody, I don't know how much damage it's doing by me not giving that. Um, and so however you read into that story, um, that's one way to look at it. So 5%, that is the number of church go goers that actively tithe. Uh, I was supposed to be 2018. So that was a few years ago, um, statistic, um, that only 5% of people who are actually sitting in pews actually give anything um, regularly. So people who show up will typically give some change or something like that. And of course, again, I'm not here to tell you what to do with your money. I'm not here to tell you which giving practice is most important or who needs to get it. Of course, I'm a big proponent of actually, you know, if I'm going to go to a church, I want to look at their budget and see how much of it are they actually spending 
on the poor and in the community because, you know, I, I understand why, you know, we have concerns about all these other charities that you give them money and only like 5% of it actually makes it to someone who needs it. Um, and I think the church also has to be accountable to that same um, that same understanding. You know, I talked about some of the difficulty with Dave Ramsey's end, end goal, right? All the good people have the money instead of all the bad people. But the problem is that even good people can misuse the money. I mean, how many churches have private jets and private planes in these giant buildings? Um, and then when the city floods, you know, they don't open up that building for people who have lost their homes. So um, just because someone's quote unquote a good person doesn't mean they deserve to have all the money or that they could not possibly misuse it. So something to consider there as well. Exodus 16, 17 through 18, um, this again goes back to the wilderness community in Exodus where they're wandering and they get manna from above. Well, some gather little, some gather much, but if you read that story closely, it's all redistributed. Um, it doesn't matter if you gathered enough or, or too little. As long as you're out there being productive, um, everybody ends up with enough to eat. It mentions everybody ate and was satisfied, and so it's important to consider that you know, some of us make more money and some of us make less money, but that's not an indication of our worth or what we deserve. Um, you know, you look at the early Acts community and they shared everything that they had. Uh, and of course it says, do not keep it until morning. So those who tried to keep extra for themselves, um, they woke up the next morning and it was full of, you know, stinky and was covered in maggots and it was gross. It had rot rotted right in front of them because they tried to keep extra um, to make sure that they were taken care of instead of thinking about the people around them. And so diligence and saving is crucial, but also look around you. And of course, James 5, 1 through 6 talks about wealth rotting, specifically that which comes at the expense of others. And so little is much when God is in it. Of course, we think of Mark 12, 41 through 44, the, the story that the widow you know, all these Pharisees come and they announce these big gifts and this widow walks up and she drops in two pennies and Jesus highlights that, you know, she had given more than anybody that day. Um, the whole of the Exodus community contributed to the outfitting of the tabernacle. I think it was video two. I mentioned um, uh, Bezalel and Holiab. I can't pronounce their names very well, but, you know, they, they're highlighted as the people who had the skills to put it all together. But, you know, if you really read that story, every single person gave from what they had in order to, um, you know, build this place where God would be in their midst. Um, Deuteronomy 8, 10 through 18, don't get confused. What you earn is a result of God's provision, not your own strength. Again, a call back to video two of this series. Matthew 25, 23, faithful with little will be given much. Faithful, um, faithful with a lot will be given more. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 talks about not putting your hope in wealth, but instead being rich in good deeds. Take hold of life that is truly life. And so, you know, it, it's so easy to think that money is what makes you rich or having nice things is what makes you rich. But instead, what makes you rich as a person, um, especially if you're a person of faith, is to be a generous, kind, compassionate person who sees people in need, feels something in regard to that, and acts in a way to alleviate suffering. And so True Wealth, Ecclesiastes 5.19, Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to accept them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is the gift of God. And so... Um, you know, if God gives you wealth and possessions and he gives you the, the opportunity to enjoy those, but also to just be happy with what you have and what you do every day, you know, that in itself is a gift, according to um, the author of Ecclesiastes. True wealth is enjoying the fruit of your labors, health, your time, your flexibility, your relationships, having peace of mind, being able to serve and, and have charity towards others. And finding rest at the end of the day, um, you know, just like God on the seventh day, you know, he rested. So to be able to um, experience that for yourself, to do that um, as well, um, that is a blessing. And to be able to keep the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And so two last thoughts. True wealth is not of the pocket, but of the heart and the mind. And the mark of true wealth is determined by how much one can give away, not by how much one has. 
And so the final thing here is just kind of a faithful giving analysis. You know, really think through, um, you know, what does giving look like for you? Again, um, I'm not going to tell you how to specifically do that. You know, if you go to church, they're going to tell you it's 10% of your pre-tax income needs to go to the church. But um, and so maybe that's a good place to start. Um, you know, there's statistics that show that people who make $20,000 a year are more likely to give um, than people who make 70000 plus per year. Um, there's something about being in need and seeing need that makes you more generous than feeling like you have enough or you need more. And so, you know, think about that. Again, we've talked a lot about our relationship to money throughout this series. And so I hope that something um, at least stirs within you um, to make some kind of change, that there are opportunities, no matter how much or how little you make, um, to you know, be blessed by blessing others. And of course, I wanted to share some resources here. Um, there's a couple books that I've found very helpful. So the first one, The Opposite of Spoiled, Raising Kids Who Are Grounded, Generous, and Smart About Money by Ron Lieber. Uh, it's a thoughtful and often inspiring book that also delivers dozens of smart practical tips for turning conversations about money into lessons about living. If you've got kids, want kids, or heck, have been a kid, read this book. Uh, the second book, Make Your Kid a Money Genius, Even If You're Not, A Parent's Guide to Kids 3-23 to by Beth Kovliner. Uh, many of us don't have a clue about money management and therefore chances are good that our kids won't either. Beth Kovliner throws a lifeline into that abyss with her frank, factual, and funny how-to manual, a must-have whether your kid is in preschool or grad school. Dave Ramsey's Worksheets and the Total Money Makeover, um, Finance Toolbox, um, is something that I made. So again, Dave Ramsey, you know, he's got a lot of free worksheets. So even if you don't necessarily buy and read his books, which I don't necessarily 100% recommend, but don't, you know, certainly wouldn't speak ill of, um, you know, he's got some free worksheets on his website. He's got some free resources that are very helpful. There's um, You Need a Budget, YN, uh, YB. That's a very helpful resource that um, can help you budget. And then Finance Toolbox, I have a link on my page. These are just tools that I've compiled over time. That could be helpful to the average person. Um, so some free budget worksheets, some free um, debt uh, payoff tools, some free um, investing tools. Those are all on there. You can find that on my uh, main profile. And I, I probably haven't mentioned it here but in any of these videos, but I appreciate if you like and subscribe or comment. Um, let me know what I could do better. And I, I appreciate it if you made this through it this far. If this is the first video you watched, I definitely encourage you to watch some of my earlier videos. Uh, regardless, I appreciate your time um, and look forward to hearing from you.